that's one word. This series is words to live by. A lot of words here, but uh, I'm going to be talking about the words to live by series. And just like Craig is out exploring, traveling Europe right now with his family, I also got to go on a trip to Europe. Uh, I was there for about three and a half months. I just got back Saturday, just in time for VBS. Um, so everyone's been asking me, are you really tired? And I am, but it's not from the trip, it's from VBS, because that is a long week. Um, and so if you see any of those volunteers, like Michelle said, we had a lot of fun, uh, but a lot of people put a lot of work into it before, during, and after. Um, some people would go to work all day, then come hang out with these kids for a few hours, and some of them even go home and there's kids that live in their house, and then they have to deal with that. So uh, if you see any of those people, definitely give them a pat on the back and say thanks today for that. Um, like I said, I just got to come back on Saturday, and the worst part of when someone comes back from a big trip or from study abroad or one of those things is that it's all they can talk about for like the next five years. And every time you talk to them, their sentence starts, well, when I was in Europe, uh, when I was in Spain, when I did this, and we're like, we get it, that has nothing to do with what we're talking about right now. We know you went to Europe. Uh, so I just want to just stay right off the bat. I promise I'm not going to do that to you guys. Um, but that being said, this entire sermon is about Europe. <laughs> so the, the promise starts at noon. So for the next hour, you just have to, I'm going to do it. So I'm just letting you guys know. Um, because coming back, I wanted to talk about uh, some of the things that I got to learn. Uh, I wasn't going to classes like Craig had to do. I got to, I got to just travel for fun. Uh, we managed to avoid each other while we were over there. I was in Denmark, and I heard he was coming the next day, so I left. I went to Norway, uh, so we did not see each other. But uh, I got to learn a lot of stuff. One of the things that I learned pretty early on is if you don't know the language and the culture, uh, it's okay to follow the crowd. You know, you're, you always grow up. You don't follow the crowd, don't follow the crowd. You know, you don't have to follow the crowd. Follow the crowd if you do not know the language, because... I was, I think I was in Spain somewhere, and I don't know Spanish at all, despite like six years. But I was sitting on the tram, and it wasn't moving, and then this announcement comes over the thing, and it was like, blah, 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 to me. And as soon as it ends, everybody stands up and like sprints off the tram, except for me, because I didn't know what was going on. I just sat there, and I was like, uh, I don't know what just happened, but you know, I should probably follow the crowd, because I don't think we're supposed to be on this tram. And so I followed them, they went to a subway, I still found my way, so uh, it's okay to follow the crowd sometimes. And another thing I learned the hard way is you need to pay attention to when the currency changes, because for the first half of my trip we used the euro, and it's kind of like the US dollar, and I got really used to that exchange rate. But then when you get to Eastern Europe, they all use something different. And so when I first got to Prague, I went to the ATM and I hadn't looked up the currency exchange rate. And so I just picked the middle button. I'm like, I'm here for five days. This is probably like a normal amount of money. Uh, and then when I got to my hostel and paid, I was like, oh, that must be pretty cheap then. And then I realized I had taken out like $700 in this prog money and I was just carrying it around in cash. I had no idea how much it was. Um, so I was like, I guess this is gonna be like a great five days in Prague. I am loaded. And then, uh, so yeah, you need to pay attention to that because they change. And uh, I did not have an exact budget like for each day, but it was not 700 in five days. I know that. So you learn a lot over there, mostly from your mistakes, but also just, just from experiences. And, and kind of on a more serious note, and, and the word I want to talk about today is fulfillment. Because one of the biggest things I learned uh, before I left, everyone was like, this is the trip of a lifetime, trip of a lifetime. You always hear that. And when I kind of got towards the end, I realized, you know, is this trip really going to fulfill me for a lifetime? Is this it? Because I wasn't even on the plane home yet, and I was already talking about the next trip I'm going to go on somewhere else. You know, there's got to be something bigger than this trip, more fun. I'm going to go do it next. My mom's like, no, you're not. You're, you're coming back. And, you know, that's probably true. I probably should stay and go back to school. But what I learned is no matter what we do, no matter how awesome it was, because here I am, I got to go on this amazing trip. Not a lot of people get to go. Uh, I had a great time, and I still wasn't satisfied with it. I still was like, well, I want to go here now. Like, I'm still complaining about it. Uh, and I won't complain to you guys, because you, you you'll be mad at me. I'm already talking about Europe the whole time. But what I learned is we're always searching for the next big thing. We're never quite fulfilled. We're never quite satisfied 
whether it's a big vacation or trip, and as soon as we come back, we're already planning the next one, we want more. Whether it's at our jobs, we want the next promotion, the next pay raise, the next big thing. Whether it's money and building up our bank account, and every time we look at it, we're just not quite satisfied. Whether it's relationships and our marriage and our families and our friendships all need to be perfect and we're never fulfilled with how they are. We're always comparing. Uh, whether it's any of those things, they, they never quite fulfill us no matter what we do, no matter how perfect they can be. And I, I think this is just kind of a universal human condition that we never feel fulfilled because I know I feel it even when things are great. And as I traveled and got to know people, I started to realize we all kind of feel this way. Um, when you're in the hostels and you meet new people, you, you do the name, where you're from, where you've been, where you're traveling, how long, blah, blah, blah. Like I could do that routine in my sleep because you do it to like 10 people a day when you're in the hostels. But another interesting question a lot of people ask you is like, why are you traveling? You're, you're going around Europe for three months, why are you traveling? And a lot of people are like me that are doing a gap year trip for fun and just, just want to see more of Europe and the world. Uh, but you meet a lot of people who are traveling searching for fulfillment. And a lot of people you ask, they, they were at home, they weren't content, they hated their job, they didn't like their group of friends, and so they just quit everything and left uh, to, to go out and search and, and find that thing that's going to fulfill them. You meet people who, you know, just got out of a relationship or just lost someone in their family, and so they're going on this trip trying to fill that hole that was just created in their life. Uh, you meet a lot of people who are simply just running away from whatever problems waiting for them when they get back at home, uh, and they're going to stay in Europe as long as they can to avoid it. But I started to notice this universal thing of like, here we are, we're all on this trip, and so many people aren't, aren't fulfilled, and they're, they're looking for it in Europe, and I don't think they're going to find it over there. And uh, there's a book in the Bible in the Old Testament called Ecclesiastes, and it was written by King Solomon, and he kind of goes through this same problem. He's having these same feelings of not feeling fulfilled, feeling like there's more out there for him. And he, don't, he doesn't know what it is, but he knows he's not happy with how it is, and he wants to find that thing that's, that's going to make him feel whole. And uh, Chad gave me some notes on King Solomon because he has a real master's degree in this stuff, and uh, I have a paramedic license. So <laughs> he, he gave me some notes on King Solomon, and it turns out that this guy had it. This guy had it all. Like, he was the wisest man ever. He, you know, God said, I'll give you one gift, and he chose wisdom, which is a good choice. So he, he's wise. He has all the knowledge. He was possibly the richest man, like, in the history of humanity. Uh, they think he was probably worth over $100 billion. So he's wise. He has all the money. He's the king. He has all the power. He was one of the most successful kings uh, in the history of the world. And yet here he is writing this book, Ecclesiastes, and he's still looking for something more. He's not fulfilled. He still feels like something's missing. And he, he goes through this book trying to figure out what is, what is going to make me feel fulfilled? What am I missing? What do I still need, even though I have all this stuff? So uh, I'm going to warn you guys, the beginning's pretty depressing. So if you, if you drop out halfway through the sermon, you're going to miss it because it, it starts off really hopeless. Uh, but it gets good at the end, so stay with me. But at the beginning, he starts like right off the bat, he's, he's looking for this thing that's going to give his life meaning, that's going to make him feel fulfilled. And he says, everything I consider is meaningless, completely meaningless. He's observed everything that's gone on under the sun and found it really is all meaningless like chasing the wind. Everything is wearisome beyond description. No matter how much we see, we're never satisfied. No matter how much we hear, we are not content. And so... I think we, a lot of us can relate to that of we want to find meaning, but we look around and we're like, no matter how much we see, no matter how much we do here, no matter how much we have, when we still lay down at night, we're kind of like, there's got to be more than this. Um, I think a lot of us struggle with that. A lot of us are still looking for that thing. We want to know, how can I feel fulfilled? How can I be content with the life I have? And Solomon, this powerful king who has everything, is asking himself these same questions. So he starts going through all the things, uh, looking for fulfillment. And he starts uh, where I think a lot of people start, and that's with the really simple pleasures, the simple things that we think are going to make us happy. Uh, drinking, drugs, going out, having fun, trying to find that next big thrill. And that's where he starts too. And so he says, I said to myself, come on, let's try pleasure. pleasure. Let's look for the good things in life. And he already has it in quotes, so he doesn't have a lot of hope in the good things. 
But he says, I found this too was meaningless. What good is it to seek pleasure? After much thought, I decided to try to cheer myself with wine. And while seeking wisdom, I clutched at foolishness. In this way, I tried to experience the only happiness most people find in their brief life in this world. And I think this, these simple pleasures, the things we think are going to make us happy, are by far the emptiest places we can look. And if you've experienced it yourself or you know someone who, who really looks to these things for fulfillment, you see how empty they can be because they're the most temporary. It's, it's happy, it's fun while it's happening, but it's immediately over and it's going to be much worse the next day afterwards. But I think a lot of people still turn to these simple pleasures and to the good things in life to, to try to make them feel fulfilled and make them feel alive. And when I was in Switzerland, I got a chance to go skydiving there uh, with somebody, not by myself. And when we were riding up together, um, I was like, I need to check, make sure this guy's, th this guy's safe. So I asked him, you know, how long have you been skydiving? And he said his first jump was in 1997. And I was five years old, so I figured that was, he was probably good. And uh, so while you're up there, you get strapped together, so I'm like, might as well talk to this guy, we're strapped together. And on the way up, I was like, do you get like a thrill from this anymore, from skydiving? He does it like six times a day for his job. When these groups come in, they just go over and over and over. I was like, do you get any adrenaline, excitement from skydiving anymore? And he told me, literally none. Like, it's just another day at the office for me. There's no thrill anymore. And I was like, just another day at the office. So that means when I wake up and go to the ministry center, and hang out with Chad and Michelle and Jenny and everyone in there, that's just as thrilling for me as it is for him to jump out of planes <laughs> every day. <laughs> Chad's mad. It's fun. <laughs> but, you know, even the, even the greatest, biggest thrill that a lot of us can have, you know, jumping out of a plane, it was really scary for me. I had a lot of adrenaline. It eventually wears off. No matter what great thrill we find, it eventually wears off. It's not lasting. And, and when it comes to all these simple pleasures, when, when we spend so much time in them, it eventually wears off and we're still going to have this problem. And, and that's what King Solomon realized almost immediately with this one. This one is not hard. It's like, I tried, tried some wine, didn't work. Uh, I'm not going to find fulfillment in these things. So next he turns to one that seems a little more promising. I think a lot of us look here, and that's in money. And like I said, uh, if anyone can be fulfilled by money, it was this guy. He was worth over $100 billion, probably the richest man in history. Uh, if money can fulfill us, this guy's going to figure it out. And this is what he writes about money. Those who love money will never have enough. How meaningless to think that wealth could bring true, true happiness. The more you have, this is, this is true, my dad told me, the more you have, the more people come help you to spend it. So he's like, the more money I put in my wallet, the more you and Zach will come and ask me for it. So he just doesn't carry it anymore. Uh, so what good is wealth except perhaps to watch it slip through your fingers? People who work hard will sleep well whether they have little or a lot, but the rich seldom get a good night's sleep. And I, I think definitely in our culture, uh, in the Western world, money is like a common place people go to try to find fulfillment. If they can just build that up enough, they'll be worth something. Uh, I think we see a lot of people who think if I'm worth something financially, I'm worth something as a person. And they're trying to get there, they're trying to get there, and it's never quite enough. Even the rich people are still looking for more. Uh, like Solomon said, it's, it's completely meaningless because you're never going to get to that point. And uh, if he had $100 billion and didn't find fulfillment there, we're not going to find it. Uh, we're not even going to find $100 billion, so we're not going to find fulfillment in money. It's, it's a completely worthless place to look for fulfillment. And when you're in Europe and you go to all these different big cities, the, the thing you have to do in every city is go see the palace, right? Because a lot of these cities, they used to have kings, queens, these royal families. And it was basically a big contest of who can build the biggest, best palace. And so they all have these amazing palaces and you can go take tours. And, you know, kind of after a while, you realize these are the most excessive, like, worthless things ever because I was on a tour in one and they take you through and they show you all the rooms and so you have the king's room you know the queen's room and then there's bedrooms for and then they're like and this is a bedroom and this is a bedroom this is no one's bedroom you know this is a room there's not really anything it they're just completely worthless they just wanted to build up and show that they had the most stuff 
and, and at the end of the day, it didn't fulfill them. They were always constantly searching for the next biggest, newest palace to impress everyone. Uh, and Solomon says the same thing, you know, this, this searching for money, it's endless because you're always going to want more. And, and so he starts to look somewhere else. He starts to look, what about relationships with people? You know, that has to be fulfilling, having loving, happy relationships with people. And this kind of really related to me because I'm at that age, like right after you graduate college, where everyone is either getting engaged or married or all the single people like really stressed out about getting engaged and married. They're very concerned about it. And you talk to some of these people um, that are really worried, oh no, I'm 23, like I need to get engaged, I need to get married, Uh, what's gonna happen to me? And it seems like they really believe, you know, if I could fall in love and get someone to fall in love with me and get married, that would just solve everything and I would be happy and everything would be perfect. And so I can't speak on this personally because I'm not married, but uh, you guys, a lot of you guys are. So I figured I would just ask you, uh, is it true that when you get married, like all your problems go away? (laughs) Nobody's, is it true? (laughs) Um, The first, someone said no really loud in the first one. I think you might be in trouble later. (laughs) But so you guys didn't answer, but you don't have to say it. but the, the truth is, like, those relationships, they're great. And even King Solomon writes, you know, these things are great. We need these relationships. We need family and friends in these loving relationships. But if we start thinking that this love is going to fulfill us, we're still going to end up disappointed and we're still going to end up uncontent because we're not going to find lasting fulfillment in other broken people. We can't offer that perfect love to anyone else and they're not going to offer it to us. And if we start expecting to find it there, we're only going to be disappointed. And a psychologist kind of, who kind of looked into these issues of fulfillment and people being unsatisfied wrote, you know, the problem with looking to romantic love and personal fulfillment and all of these sort of things is they all eventually wear off. They all eventually fall apart. And if they're not backed up and reinforced by something real, we all end up in despair. And so when I hear that as Christians, we realize, you know, we, we do have a relationship that's lasting, that's real, it's with Jesus, that's why we're here. Uh, when, we, when we look to that relationship for fulfillment, not only are we gonna find it, but we're gonna have better relationships with other people as a, as a consequence of that. But Solomon says, yep, these relationships, they're great. Uh, I did not find fulfillment though. He had hundreds of wives. He probably had lots of friends and servants. He did not find it in those relationships. And so he's got, he's got one more idea here at the end to try and find fulfillment. And I think this is probably the one that we have the most hope in, that we turn to the most. We, we really believe in this one, and that's kind of worldly success. Uh, not just money, but being successful in our careers, being successful parents, successful spouses. We've got perfect families. Maybe it's, it's even being a successful Christian and being like, wow, look at them. They follow all the rules. They're so great. Uh, whatever kind of success you're chasing, uh, that's kind of what he's talking about here. And he was pretty successful. And this is what he writes about his search for success and finding fulfillment there. He says, I also tried to find meaning by building huge homes for myself and planting beautiful vineyards. I owned large herds of flocks more than any king before me. I had great sums of gold and silver and treasures. I hired wonderful singers and had many beautiful wives. I had everything a man could desire. I became greater than any king before me and my wisdom never failed. Anything I wanted, I would take. I denied myself no pleasure. I even found great pleasure in my hard work. But as I looked at everything I had worked hard to accomplish and everything I had, I realized it was still all meaningless. There was nothing worthwhile anywhere. So even after all the success, he comes to the same point that he came to with all the other things is it doesn't do it. I'm still feeling empty. I'm still unfulfilled. I still want more. And I think so many of us, myself included, we all spend life chasing success, whatever that looks like for us. We all think, if I just get that one thing, if I just get my kids to behave, if I just get this, that will for sure do it. I'll feel fulfilled. I'll feel like someone important. And it's just not there. We're still going to end up empty. And it kind of reminds me of, uh, I have a black lab at home named Buster, and he chases his tail all the time. I don't know if your guys' dogs do that, but he'll spin and spin and spin. He works really hard at it, and he's actually pretty good. And sometimes he can get his tail, and he'll bite it. And it's kind of funny to see him when he spins around, and then he finally gets it. 
because he works so hard and then once he has it, he's like, he doesn't know what to do, he just drops it and goes and lays down. <laughs> you know, he's, he's like, oh, I really want that tail, this is gonna be awesome. And then he gets it, he's like, oh, and he just lays down. And that's kind of how we are with success. We're gonna spin around and we're gonna work really, really hard, but when we get it, we're gonna be like, oh, this wasn't what I thought it was gonna be. Eh, you know, we'll try again later. And, and that's kind of how we are with success. We're like a dog chasing our tail. Even if we get it, we're gonna be like, oh, well, okay. Um, and in one of my favorite interviews that kind of reminds me of this, a very successful person, uh, he's a football player, his name's Tom Brady. He's quarterback for the Patriots. He's pretty good. He's kind of in trouble right now, but he's still pretty good. And they did this interview on 60 Minutes of him, and it probably did not help his ego, but it was basically about how great his life is and how everything is perfect for him. It talked about you know, his success on the field, his success success off the field, he has this beautiful model wife, he has all this money, you know, New England loves him, he's so great, and they do this whole show about just how perfect his life is, and he has everything. And at the end, you know, they're sitting across from him doing the interview, and they're like, Tom Brady, you have everything you've ever dreamed of, but how does it feel? And he gives a really honest answer here, and he says, I think, why do I have these Super Bowl rings and still think there's something greater out there for me. I mean, maybe people would look at it and say, hey man, this is what it is. You've reached your dream, your goal, your life is complete. Me, I sit here and think, there's gotta be more than this. And it's kind of that pivotal moment and the, the interviewer probably wasn't expecting that, but Tom Brady goes, there's gotta be more than this. And he says, well, what do you think the answer is? And Tom Brady just goes, I wish I knew. And that's just the end of the interview. And and I think it's interesting when we watch that as Christians because I can't help but think, and Christians probably can't help but think, we know what that missing thing is. We know why you don't feel fulfilled. You know, you have four rings. If, if you get five, it would be cool like to have the whole hand, but if four doesn't make you feel fulfilled, five's not gonna do it. Uh, and, and on that interview, Tom Brady's still looking for more after everything, you know, they just did this whole show about he has everything. And all he can say is, it, it doesn't fulfill me. And, and that kind of answers the question. We can search for fulfillment in a big trip to Europe, in money, in our career and success, in other people, um, but Ecclesiastes comes to the same conclusion at the end that it's only in God that this is gonna happen. It's not gonna happen in all these other things. And he writes towards the end of this, God has planted eternity in the human heart. He's basically saying, you know, God made you this way to search for something greater, and that's me. Yeah, that's the only place you're gonna find it. He's basically saying, you have this God-shaped hole in you, that's why you feel like something's missing, and the more you try to fill it with other stuff, the more you're gonna realize it doesn't work, uh, because it's all meaningless at the end. And another pastor talked about this, and I thought he had a really good quote. He says, there is a deep and natural craving in the human heart that can be satisfied nowhere except in God. Most of us depress that deep longing for God and try to seek satisfaction from the world. Such a path can only lead to despair because if we have a Jesus-shaped hole, it can only be filled with him. None of those other things are gonna, are gonna fulfill us. King Solomon wasn't fulfilled with them. Tom Brady is not fulfilled with them. We're not gonna be fulfilled. And so here's kind of the, the bright light at the end of King Solomon's depressing book. Uh, he says, I have noticed one thing at least in this world that is good. And that is to enjoy your lot in life because this is indeed a gift from God. He writes, who can eat or enjoy anything apart from God for he gives joy to those who please him. So after all these things, he comes to the end and he's like, the only thing that's gonna make me feel fulfilled, the only reason I can enjoy these other things is because of God and because of my relationship with him in the end. And in the passage that Celeste wrote, uh, Jesus is trying to teach his disciples the same thing, and like usual, the disciples are kind of not getting it. Uh, they always kind of take a few times. But the story that she read, it's the day after he fed the 5,000 with all the bread. So he comes up, all these people are gathered again, and they're kind of like, you should do that thing with the bread again, like give us all free bread. And he looks at them and he says, you know, why are you so worried about all these perishable things? Spend your energy seeking the eternal life that the Son of Man can give you. And in typical disciple fashion, they do not get it. They still want the bread. And they're like, you know, we'll, we'll believe in you. You should show us a miracle. 
And, and we have a good idea of what the miracle can be, the bread thing, again. And they, th they think they're sneaky, but um, Jesus is like, we're not doing the bread thing again. I'm trying to teach you guys something. And so he said, you know, that, that bread that Moses gave your ancestors was actually from God. And, and God sent me here to be the true bread for you now. And he says, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. And he's not telling them, you know, I have special bread. You're never going to have to eat again. Uh, it's obviously a metaphor. And he's talking about you guys are constantly waking up every day searching for something, whether it's bread or success or whatever it is that day. Um, I'm here to tell you that I'm that thing. I'm that thing you're looking for. If you have a relationship with me, if you spend time with me, you're never going to have that longing again. Um, I heard another pastor tell a story about her daughter, and she said she was in the kitchen one day, and she was making a cake up there, and the kid's hungry, crying, whining, wants it to be done. She's like, just a second, I'm baking a cake. It's going to be awesome. Uh, just wait a little bit longer. You're going to be fine. So finally, the cake gets done. She's frosting it, and she looks, and the kid's gone. And so she's looking around the kitchen, and she finds the kid had crawled over. They've got their hand under the fridge, which, you know, is the dirtiest part of almost any house under the fridge. This kid is under the fridge, digging around, pulls out a dusty, dirty Cheerio and puts it in her mouth. And the mom's like, I seriously have a cake on the table, and you're over here eating dusty Cheerios from under the fridge. And, and she's like, in that moment, I realized, you know, this is how we are with God. Like, he's baked a cake for us. It's right there. It's waiting for us. Yet here we are on earth crawling around eating these dusty Cheerios, thinking that's going to be better, that's going to make us full, that's going to satisfy us more than, than the cake that God made for us. Um, we're, we're definitely like that kid. And whether the dusty Cheerio is your bank account or your job or your family, or, or maybe it's just trying to have a good time, it, it's never going to compare to that cake that God made that God has waiting for you. You're never going to find fulfillment in that. Um, you can eat as many dusty Cheerios as you want. You're still going to be hungry and it's going to taste disgusting. Um, so, you know, we, the sooner we find it out, the better. The sooner we stop crawling around expecting these dusty Cheerios to be a better meal, uh, the better off we're going to be and the more fulfilled we're going to be. So as I kind of wrap up here, just, just some questions to consider uh, as you leave and to kind of think more about fulfillment for you personally. Uh, the first one is just, do you feel fulfilled? Uh, do you feel fulfilled with your life? Are you content? Are you happy? Are you satisfied? Um, if you're like most people on most days, that's going to be no, because as humans, we just hardly ever are. Um, and if your answer is no, I kind of want you to do what King Solomon did and go through those things. What are those things that I'm chasing, like a dog chasing his tail? What am I chasing? What dusty Cheerios am I eating that I'm trying to get to fulfill me, that I'm thinking are going to be the thing to make me happy? Um, what are those things? And how can I, you know, enjoy life and not realize, and, and start to realize that those things aren't going to be what fulfills us? How can I turn that focus to my relationship with Jesus uh, to start filling that God-shaped hole with God and not with all these other things that, that just lead to disappointment in the end? Uh, and I hope that, that we can start shifting that focus and, and start feeling more fulfilled. So uh, would you guys all bow your heads and join me in prayer?